we made dogs. Dogs exist because of us. Yeah. And we can't just let them just hang around just because they're like, we have this innate connection with these dogs. We need to honor and fulfill what our ancestors did for them. We need to keep that going because if we don't, we're going to have more issues with with um, with council and with the laws and with other dog owners or other people being um, disadvantaged by us as dog owners. Even dogs barking constantly all day or if a dog attacks your cat or kills one of your family members, like, my God, how horrific is that? Yeah. So we need to we need to be doing this so that we're there. We're constantly giving our dogs that purpose. Makes sense. Welcome to episode two with Life With Your Dog, brother. Here we are, man. We are here back again. So we're going to get into the meat of it from, it. from this episode forward. 100%. Um, so you've got, you you know, you've developed a list of topics for each episode. Yep. Um, so what are we doing today? Today's talking about all dogs need a job. Okay. Yeah. So where do we get started? I guess we'll go right to the beginning about yep. how at the beginning of all my sessions with my clients, I talk a little bit of theory. So we understand where we're taking the direction of our training. Yeah. If we don't know why we're doing what we're doing, well, then it's going to be hard to do the what and right. the how. If you don't have a goal or a direction, That's right. you, you don't know what you're moving towards, right? 100%. Yeah. Definitely. So, um, yeah, basically all dogs need a job. Yeah. See, all dogs were designed to do a job, whether they were pulling sleds, herding sheep, retrieving game, and so many different dog right. jobs that dogs were doing. And now that we have dogs as our companions, they miss out on that job. Right. And if we don't give them a job, they lack purpose and they find their own ways to fulfill themselves. Right. Because now we might think of their job as purely to be a companion, which is probably the wrong way to think about it, right? I think maybe one part That's of part their, of their job. Yeah, for, for us. Sure. But for them, if we're not giving back to them what – if we're not biologically fulfilling them and, yep. doing, and doing the activities, routines and structure of – fulfilling their mind and body consistently, yeah. then we're going to start to see some issues. And so, yeah, back to um, back to the little spill that I give is that now that we have them as our companions and miss out on that job and when they lack purpose, yeah. they find their own ways to fulfill themselves. Whether that's mucking up or Destructive chewing the behavior, couch. barking at the birds, digging the holes, chasing the dogs and you yeah. know, the list goes on forever. Yeah. And we call them problem behaviors. So they're, behave- they're behaviors that dogs would do naturally or instinctively, but we see them as a problem because they're not aligning with what we like them to right. do. So what we need to do as dog owners is give our dog a job, give them a sense of purpose. And the best ways to do that is obedience training. So teaching our dogs sit down, stay, come, you know, bed command and a range of commands that we're going to work on. Along with that, the structured walk is probably the most important job that we give our dogs. So going for a walk should be a daily activity anyway. Yep. I, I say to my clients, let's try to average around 60 minutes a day. Okay. And when we're out on the walk, what we want is that our dogs are on a loose lead next to us. They focus on us. Loose lead meaning a longer lead? Loose lead meaning however long the lead is that there's no tension on they're it. So they're pulling. not pulling us. Right. Now, there's a few reasons why we want loose lead walking. First of all, is that it should be comfortable for us. Because yep. if we're struggling to walk our dog and then we find it frustrating – well, then less likely we're going to walk our dogs. Okay. Number one. Number two is that if we're letting our dogs pee here, sniff there, jump here, chase that between our legs, back and forth, it becomes our dogs are getting physical fulfillment, but they're finding more focus on the environment around them yeah. rather than on what we want them to do. Okay. So one, some of the goals that we work on for my personal dogs and for all my clients is that our dogs walk on a loose lead next to us. If we stop, they stop. We say sit, they sit. We say, okay, then they're allowed to walk again. So a few things are happening there. The mind and the body is working together. They're having to think and move simultaneously. But also we become a better leader. They become a better follower. And that way they're throughout that activity. There's more fulfillment in that act, in that job that they're doing rather than relying on that physical outlet. If we run our dogs and just let them run and run and run and being part of their exercise, that's still really good exercise. However, the more they run, the more fit they become. And the more we need to run them to get them more tired again, and we're doing five-hour jobs of, of running them all day. Mm. So part of the walk and generally how we do the walk is that we split the walk into three parts. We do 20-minute structured walk, yep. which is not really heel, like what most people see heel is a very focused heel. It's more of we're just loosely walking. Um, don't be excessively pulling, so no tension on the lead. Know where I am with peripheral vision. I don't want my dog staring at me. I do want them to be interested in the world around them. Yeah. And they're allowed to go to the toilet and things like that. But when we're walking, we want it to be comfortable and our dogs to be relatively focused. Yeah. Then we get to the park. We put them on a 10-meter long lead 
where they can pee, poo, play, sniff, chase a ball and do what they like to express themselves. Yeah. And then we do that 20 minutes walk back home. So if we split that hour into three parts, then we're ticking all the boxes and our dogs generally come home a lot more fulfilled, tired, um, exercised properly, and then we can live with them better. Mm. So if we treat the exercises that we're doing, so obedience training and walking, these are, again, I use those two examples because with most of my you know pet dog owners and, the, and my clients, yeah. is that most people aren't putting their dog to work. So there are other th- ways that we can fulfill our dog's needs for sure, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. But if we can work on all the basics – and make it a daily routine. So we normally do about three to five sessions a day, three to five minutes each session with training sessions, just improving those basic skills. We want our dog to be able to come back when we call them, especially in busy environments, Right, hold it down, stay. That's a, that's a safety thing really, isn't it? 100%. You know, if something is, is dangerous, you need to be able to call the dog mm. and, and assume that they're going to come back on command. Definitely. Well, actually, funny you say that. So yesterday my client said the – collar that she had the dog on she didn't adjust it properly the dog then slipped out of it went to go run towards somebody to say hi straight away she gave that recall command and he dashed back to her wow and she was like it was amazing and i'm like that's exactly why we have the recall of course for safety not just for the dog but for other people Mm. and what if your dog was to run on the road for example you know then we have a car accident things like that so that recall is really really important and we've got to treat our training, not just as teaching practical commands. There's three things we do training for. Teaching practical commands so we can, as we just explained, there's reasons for it. We're teaching our dogs that mind and body have to work together. Mm. So doing obedience training or other forms of training, your dog really has to think and work towards the goals that we set out for them. So then each session is progressively getting towards our goal. So we yeah. can proof of behavior so we can do it with no treats and no lead. That would be the end goal. Right. Um, and then also it becomes a bonding time. The more you hang out and you practice these things with your dog, the more you you and your dog have a better connection. Okay. Where if we – and I see it a lot. People say, I want my dog to just be free and just to have fun, right. do whatever they want. And that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Put that into practice, especially with, you know, your more boisterous – it doesn't have to be a boisterous big dog, but let's just go with a big boisterous dog. Do you think maybe they're thinking of it like a um, like a child as opposed to a dog? Like I want my kid to just run free in the park and just have fun. And For sure. Yeah. I think that they're just trying to impose things that they would like on their own self. Yeah. However, and as we all know, is that if we don't put ourselves to work, if we don't have purpose, if we don't have a job to go to, exercise routine, sport activities, looking yeah. after your family, you know, looking after your house, all these responsibilities that we have, Structure. if we didn't have those structures, yeah, then we would deteriorate mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. So as much as we don't, like, let's be honest, I love working out but I don't love getting to the workout right. because I'd rather sleep in and just do yeah. nothing, right? So the hardest um, part is showing up. Exactly. Yeah. But once you're into it, then it feels good. And then as we just had a conversation before is that after a workout, so I try to work out, you know, a few times a week. Yeah. And from after that workout, everything feels better. Yeah. Stress levels are down. Yeah. I feel more clear. My body feels alive. Yeah. And um, and then from there, there's less stress in the day and I can deal with my the opportunities that come yeah. or the obstacles that come a lot more easier. Well, we are animals, man. We're designed to move, you know, and I think unfortunately we, we find ourselves now in a modern world, a modern society where a lot of people are going from the bed to the car to the desk, back to the car, back to the house. And you know? in our society, we have more suffering. More people are suffering and that, that number is getting higher with anxiety and depression. Yeah. Again, my... Like I'm no expert in that field, but I know from my own personal life is that I feel a lot better when I put myself to job. Absolutely. And I learned all of this by working with the dogs. Like, you know, I'm out there preaching to all my clients, talking about your dog needs a job, mental and physical stimulation. We call it biological fulfillment. Yeah. And thinking about biological fulfillment means that we're honoring and fulfilling that need that is instinctive. Because if we don't give ourselves that domestic job, because obedience training, sit down, stay calm, aren't natural behaviors that dogs do in the world. No dog's calling the other dog back in the way, in the fashion that we do. But I guess no dog's hurting sheep and not attacking them to kill them either. So we've created dogs from that instinctive animal, which was a wolf-like dog. And then over the duration of time, we've made them into herding dogs, hunting dogs, you know, um, scent detection dogs, you know, and sled pulling dogs, like so many different jobs. And we did that through selective breeding. And we did that through obviously finding the right dog for the job. And then as we bred them on and we continued 
being more sophisticated with the way we work them, the breed then started to develop into what they were. Mm. But then now we have them here, we're not in the agricultural age. So we don't have them to do those jobs like who has sheep for their kelpie to chase and who's got a sled for their husky to pull. So we need to come up with this job for them. And um, But also there has to be practicality to it. So if we're not seeing it as a practical use, well then – the truth is most people aren't going to do it. Mm. So there are other working roles that we can give our dogs. Like there's a lot of dogs that um, sign up for like nose works, which is um, like it's more of like a, a trialing sort of space where the sport people rock up with their dogs and we teach the dogs to find certain scents. Huh. And then there's like they do trials and, you know, it's a really cool, sophisticated way for um, for normal everyday dog owners to enroll their dogs into a sport or there's agility training you know fly ball you know there's so many different things that we can do with our dogs you know some people do um sport training with their dogs and they do protect protection work yeah. they do um tracking they you know so we can like for more the enthusiasts they're going down that route because yeah. it's a lot more in depth and more specialized specialized yeah. and of course if you've got the breed for that job well then you know we we us people are very passionate about yeah. it yeah but for the everyday person who's got, you know, the toy poodle or who's just got their staffy, we need to come up with ways to fulfill that dog's specific needs. And, man, we can talk so much about, and that's what we're going to do, is about trying to analyse what dog would generally like a certain job. So, you know, each dog is going to tell us what they're motivated by and we need to fulfill that, fill that void before they create issues in our yeah. own life. And we see that all the time. So, um, so you see that a lot with your clients? Definitely. See, like the dog's of- misbehaving, and the client says, "Oh, what's wrong with my dog?" And you're like, "Well, he's not being fulfilled." Yeah, hundred percent. And also, then there's other issues where we're reinforcing all the wrong behaviors. Right. So we're constantly telling our dogs no, 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 and we forget to tell them what we want them to do. Right. So, I guess there's kind of two sides of the coin. There's in the background, we're giving our dogs st- structure and discipline, and we're fulfilling this routine every day. Yeah. So that way then the dog is in a routine. He knows what he has to do. Oh, it's time for a walk. I come to the door. I hold the seat. We put the lead on. We open the door. I say, okay, we walk out. The dog has to think about these practices where if if I didn't have any of those things, we whack the lead on and boom, the dog pulls us through the door. Mm. We go up the street. He's pulling us here. He's trying to jump on the other dog and... You know, people are going to average a 15-minute walk because they come home and they're physically sore if it's a big, strong dog or they feel embarrassed or they're, they're frustrated. So, And then, of course, dogs can get up to you know, up to mischief, you know, yeah. like, you know, walking the dog down the street. My dog wants to say hi to your dog. They jump on each other. They get caught up in the leads and then a situation can arise. So the more we have control over our dogs, it's yeah. not trying to be tyrannical in a sense of trying to have so much control over this dog where we're kind of imposing our ego onto it. We just want to give our dogs some guidance, right? How to operate with the world, and um, you know, like with Spades, who's here with me right now, and he comes to all my jobs with me. Everyone comments about how cool he is, yeah, because he's a. I've really- never seen a dog that's more behaved than that <laughs> that dog, man. It's incredible. Well, you're a good, like I, you know, and for the listeners, like um, I came and, and watched you do a client session last weekend, and I just I'd heard about it because you'd worked with. Um, with Chloe, but I just to see it with my own eyes how well behaved the dogs are is just incredible, man. Like, Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, it's good. He knows that he knows the score. Even like when he you went to get him out of the car and he jumped too quickly before you told him to, and you're like, no, reset back in the car. That's it. You know, shut the door, start again. I think so. I think look, just like with us, we slip into old habits, or we just we try to find shortcuts. Dogs are always going to find a shortcut to a behavior. Yeah. So. The routine is I open the door, I say, okay, he jumps out. Yeah. Open the door, we say, okay, he jumps out. Where sometimes we want to open the door and wait a few seconds. Then I say, okay. Right. Because then one He's day- He's assuming the okay is going to come like that's that. Right. He's just going to try to cut the chain a little bit yeah. and get there a little bit quicker, yeah. which good on him. So he should. Yeah. However, I know what I want. Yeah. And when I open that door and you jump out, I say, sorry, man, back in. Because one day when I open that door and he assumes he needs to come out and he jumps out the wrong time, situation can occur so yeah. all these things that i've planned and set for my dogs i'm looking at it for the future so then i practice what i what when i don't need it and when i do need it i've got it 100 yeah. percent. and like spades is fulfilled first of all he comes out to work with me most days and he's out with me eight hours a day sometimes yeah. um and even after that we still come home and do our normal structured walk because we have nookie as well who yeah. doesn't come to all my sessions yeah um, sometimes we'll get on the blades when roll, roll the blade down to the bars and I'll do a bit of a workout or, yeah. you know, um, sometimes we'll be on the bike. Sometimes we'll, we'll practice just a, a couple of sessions of, of maintaining his level of training. So this is where a lot of people go wrong too, is that 
If you don't see it as a job, you see it as training. And then when he's achieved what he what you want from we him, stop. we stop and then the behaviors then regress back and, yeah. and we don't get what we want. So. Right. So even with um, spades, how how often or how how much maintenance do you have to do for his training? I'm lucky because he's with me most of my working day. So I'm naturally working with his behavior. So right. for example, like what you seen um, last week when you came out and seen us was that we're working with, with a dog name was Maze. And that time while I was demonstrating and doing things, Spades is holding a down stay. Mm. So I say down, he hangs out there until I say the word okay. Right. So that is training, really. And that is training. Yeah. Training is probably a bad word to use because then we assume training is on and then training is off and then right. we finish. But I think training is learning the skill. Then once you've learned the skill, you put into practice. Maintaining it. It's like if I, just, if I was 16 and just getting my license and I go and do that driver instructing course, and that guy shows me everything that I have to do. Yeah. But then I jump back in a car without him and then I go do all the things that I was doing all before. All the wrong things, yeah. Then, then he'd be like, I thought you were doing the training. It's like, oh, I only do it when he's here. It's like, yeah. you know, now you've learned it, you've now got to practice it. Right. You've got to implement it. So training is learning the skills. And I guess training is doing the activity, but we need to find where does it fit in our life. Well, they say that discipline is doing, discipline is what you do when no one's watching. That's right. Yes. Good one. You I know? like that. Yeah. Definitely. And that applies to us and to, to dogs as well. Well, we've got to live it. Like, and if I brought my dog out and he was a maniac, then why listen to me? <laughs> yeah. Now, unless it was a new dog and, you know, I've been working on him, it was a special circumstance yeah. and that would be obvious. But in this case, like Spades is my dog. I've had him since he was a puppy. And um, and even Nookie, like I haven't had her since a puppy, even though we did do puppy training with her. But like right now I say bed, she goes on her bed. Yeah. Now there's a reason for it. While we're in this setting, I don't want her running around between all the cords and bumping, knocking the bumping camera stuff. Down, yeah, right? yeah. So bed is bed, you hang out there. Now, in the early days, I would be rewarding intermittently to tell her that the longer you stay there, I'll reward you. Mm. But then now it gets to a point where what's pretty comfortable. So she's being rewarded naturally for being there. Yeah. And also gives her a sense of certainty of where she should be so we don't step on it because only three killers will squash her. But when I say the word, okay, she'll get off the bed. Right. So we need to see... Everybody needs to really focus on when you get your dog, you need to know what you're planning to do with that dog. And if we can make a good routine and rituals out of it and seeing why we're doing it and understanding it, not only are we going to live better with our dogs, but we can start implementing that within our own life. Right. Like, yeah. That was another thing that I picked up um, last week watching you. You just mentioned the word intermittent. So you're talking about almost turning the dog into a bit of a gambler in the way that you're training them to do something and you – almost randomize the reward so that they're not expecting it every single time or like as soon as they sit to get a reward or as soon as they do something to get a reward it's like that they don't know but they they you know drives them to keep doing it yeah so there's like there's three phases of training the teaching phase the training phase and then the proofing phase so depending on what phase each command is would depend on how much we're reinforcing the behavior with the reward and how much we then put pressure on the dog for not doing it yeah and then when can we get to a point where we can give the command with not giving that reinforcement in that one repetition until we can release it? So let's talk about the sit. Um, we know that she could do a good sit inside the house and she will hold the sit for, let's just say, a minute mm. until we said okay. But once we go outside of the house and there's a dog right next to her, her sit went down to three seconds and um, and then we changed the – the fa- well, she's in a certain phase of that training, so we, that would depend on how much we're going to reinforce it. So, for example, when you seen us last week, I told her to sit, and while I was explaining something, the dog got up. I put a bit of pressure on her collar, and I put pressure on her bum, so she went back into the sit. Yeah. And I now took note, well, after about five seconds, she got distracted. So while I was talking, within three to four seconds, I'd mark it and reward it. Right, before, before the five seconds. Because I don't want to keep on putting pressure on her. I'd rather be showing her it's best if you – Keep in behavior so yep. I can continue rewarding. Okay. And because she's been consistent, like we that was only our second session, there was massive changes. If you've seen, her, seen us in the first session, yeah. she struggled even walking that dog up the street, let alone having her- Because she was pulling? Pulling, she was barking, she was chasing the cars and wow. chasing the motorbikes. So, yeah. I mean, from my observation, like she was relatively calm in the second session. There was something, you know, she might- um, move before you wanted to move but she wasn't like going crazy or anything like that for sure yeah and i guess this is and that's a good point is that as i said before if we focus on stopping her reactivity to dogs and chasing the bikes and we're only waiting for that to happen then we're very reactive we're waiting for things to happen so we can fix it 
If anything, how about we start from the beginning? This is what I want you to do. Now that we've taught her what those rules are and what the the aim of the walk is, then if she went to then react to the dog, for example, I would say you've broken the rules of the walk in this particular situation and that's when we pull her up. So she's now in more control of holding these certain rules while we're out walking rather than waiting for something to happen to go, I don't want you to do that because I could be too open for the dog. She doesn't understand what is it that you don't want me to do. And I think that's really important when we are working with our dogs is we forget to praise our dogs when they're doing the right thing and we wait for them to do the wrong thing and we rouse on them. Right. It's just like parents with their kids. They're so busy, they're doing the thing and then the kids start doing weird stuff and then, and then the parents start screaming at the kid going, I don't want you to do that. Yeah. But for 25 minutes before that, they were doing everything that you want. Acknowledge wanted. the good behavior. You have to. You yeah. want to reinforce it, you want to encourage it so then we can continue on that path. Yeah. And then it makes a lot more sense. So then if we show this is what we're doing on the walk, there will be a time for free time. And we did. We went up to the park. We put on that long lead and we played with the ball and we ran around. We had lots of rumbles and rub downs. We were doing massage. We were rewarding good behavior and we are just giving her a time to just, just be a dog. Yeah. And that way there then we're still giving that release. We're not suppressing her, but we're just kind of harnessing and then controlling it towards towards the outcome that we want. Yeah. And, um, and especially with your high energy dogs, you need to give them that outlet. You can't just do structured walking all day, every day, because in the, like just like with us, I can be here right now and be focused and have a particular thing that I need to express, but there has to be a time where I need to release my energy. Of course. And it's best to release your energy though in a controlled environment. So do your martial arts or do your sporting activity, go to the gym. Like you're explosive, but it's controlled. Because mm. without control, we have injuries. We create too much chaos in our life and we're just kind of running off adrenaline. And then who stops it then? Because at the end of the day, we want to be able to have some self-discipline over ourselves to be able to put the cap on it, to be like, all right, I've done my thing now. This is a good time to stop. Yeah. Finish on a positive. And, and then, yeah, and really trying to honor your own self. And if we give our dogs this sense of impulse control through work, because impulse control is an outcome mm. of the activities that we're doing. Right. And, um, and like Spades, for example, was a very reactive dog when he was young, got attacked by a German Shepherd and... Not only did I do specific techniques when we see dogs this is what we're going to do and we went through a whole routine, I had to keep maintaining what did I want him to do when there was no dog around. So when the dog presented itself, I still want him to be able to hold that structured walk, for example, right. or hold that behavior sit down. Kind I of. noticed that the big one of the biggest um, parts of the training was um, when a distraction comes, getting the dog to look at you. Yes. So you, like you said, you've said this before, you want the you want you, the owner, to be the most interesting thing in the dog's world. And that's kind of ideal when you think about it. It's And when we talk about it now and we think about it, it's like, well, that's isn't that the point of having the dog? That mm. we have this companionship, we have this bond, and we want them to be want to engage with us. Where they engage with us heaps inside the house, you walk outside and you just become an anchor to the ship and you're not the captain anymore. Yeah. And that's where we see so much uncontrolled behavior and like, so I seen clients just this week and they have two really big, strong dogs. And unfortunately for them, they weren't able to walk their dogs. I think they were averaging one walk a month. Now that's obviously not awesome, not appropriate. Yeah. Um, and not Is acceptable. Because the dog was misbehaving or? Way too strong, had no control. Um, it was very- Big dog? Yeah, two of them. So double trouble. Um, yeah, Mastiff. So like a, big, a, strong a big dogs. Mastiff and um, I think American Staffy Cross Mastiff. So they're- pretty strong beefy dogs muscle yeah and um yeah they seen dogs that were flipping they were doing backflips they're overexcited very reactive um couldn't walk and the ladies like struggling so um this week was our third session and we met up in a new environment so we walked down through dolls point where there's loads of people and dogs and bikes and wind and everything was happening and i was really really happy with how they were walking now yeah. obviously there's still some improvements to be made but you know in the last month and a half we've made this much progress Imagine what's going to happen in six months' time yeah. or even in 12 months' time. And that's a catch-22 as well because if you don't walk the dog uh, or you walk the dog once a month, their behavior is only going to get worse because that's all building up for 30 days and then they get on the leash and they Explosion. just go, bang. That's right. Yeah. And then, of course, that's where anxiety comes from. You know, if we can't control the way that we act in cer around certain stimulus, well, then that's where that... <laughs> 
yeah <laughs> that overexcited like the panting so like even we start to hyperventilate all hey like let's be honest i was feeling a little bit nervous coming here today and that's yeah. just for all of our listeners there's something new for me and yeah. it's exciting i had a had, couple of dreams about it it was in my dreams all night last <laughs> night and um first of all that means that i'm doing something new which means that i'm growing outside of my comfort yep. zone so this is good but also because i've learned how to calm my breath and be focused and to come back into my body and not get so stuck in my head yeah. i don't come here and make a big mess out of it yeah and if we can teach our dogs to do something similar like that just of course a different we can't just teach our dogs to do yoga it would be easier <laughs> you know but if we have to be the ones that take um we have to be accountable for them we have to be managing them appropriately we have to be training them appropriately we need to be exercising them as much as we can and um and also show them what it is that they need to do to get our attention. And um, if we let them just run amok, well, then we're going to really have a bad time with our dog. So so yeah. let's say someone, uh, a dog like a, a small little dog like Nookie, mm -hmm. what's what's the job for her? Um, so the, so it would be the exact same thing, whether it's spades 38 kilos or Nookie being three kilos. We, when we're out in the walk, I want them to both be on my left-hand side on a loose lead. So not like super strict and be have to stare at me the whole time, but I don't want any pressure on the lead. If I stop, wherever I stop, I need them to stop with me. Yeah, you're in control, not the dog. Ha have that right? control. Yeah. Now, um, also, like, let's just say for her, okay, she's not going to pull me over or attack a dog. Sure. However, she could jump on a child and scare them. Right. She can get in front of me and I step on her and break a leg. Um, the other day, I was walking in my area and I put them both into a down and I walked off 100 meters, put the poo in the bin. I came back to them, grabbed the leads. Okay, they got up out of the down. We continued walking. And I made a little story about that on Instagram and I showed people I practice these things when I don't need them and when I need them, I've got them. Yeah. And there's times where I need them. And I use this example is if I'm walking down the street and an old grandma falls over. Yeah. Now, what normally happens when someone's laying on the ground, now spades wouldn't really care and you just like stand there looking at her, but Nookie will probably get a bit excited because she's a very social little dog. Yeah. And she'll probably be like, hey, hey, I'm looking at yeah, yeah, yeah. jumping on her. So down. You hold you down. I then do what I need to do, help the lady up, get her things. Are you okay? Do I need to call ambulance, etc.? I say, okay, then we continue on our way. Yeah. So using that as a random example, you can see how have that control and teach your dogs that they want to do it. Mm. Now they'd probably want rather run amok and do whatever they want. But let's be honest, we all would all like to not have to go to work and do all these things as well. Yeah. But I guess the reason why it's valuable and why it is a challenge to us, well, not a challenge, why it's um, – fulfilling because it's harder to do and um so i was speaking to clients the other day and i said to them if you won the lottery 300 million dollars like as a, as a couple if you won that million dollars um tomorrow 100 million dollars you better get yourselves back to work on monday because if you have everything that you need on tap and you don't need to do any work and then you choose to just hang out and watch TV and just do some gambling and hardly do any exercise or not giving any structure in your life, you will deteriorate mentally, physically, emotionally, yeah, spiritually pretty quickly. Maybe you'll blow all that money or maybe you will just be so lost in your life that you won't know what to do with yourself. Yeah, you've got to have structure. You've got to have a reason to get out of bed. For sure. In the first place. Now think about it. A dog living in Sydney in a good person's home has won the lottery a million times over right foods on tap or maybe not on tap but foods available when they need it they have water whenever comfortable they want house. comfortable house yeah. it's warm it's heated they are away from any other predators um any other dangers in life like of course if we're looking after them properly so if i just go cool you're in a good house and i just let them be that would probably start to suffer some form of neurosis or suffering yeah and that's when we'll start to see a manifestation of the behaviors that we don't like. Yeah. So that's why when I'm teaching people, I don't want to be just the problem solver, fixing problems all the time, because that's not working on what we need. We need to go and work on, on those solutions. And that's the same with anything. If you're feeling sick and you get sick too often, you need to review yourself and instead of just fixing up the cold that you've got, you need to look back and go, well, how do I not get sick again? Yeah. Am I not eating right? Am I not sleeping the right? The cause, not the symptom, right? That's right. Yeah. 100%. And that just doesn't go with our own health, doesn't go with dog training, that goes with everything that we do. If you keep having the same problem, if you always do what you always did, you mm. always get what you always got. Mm. You know, That's from true. a mentor of yeah. mine. And, um, and, and, and it makes sense, you know, that consistency is important. Um, practice, patience, persistence. We've got to work those three Ps as often as we can. So that way there we have... You know, we have happy dogs. And most of my clients, if they do the work that I show them to do, their dogs are living a complete 
better life. If anything, the more discipline that they that they understand in their life, the more freedom they get. Like Spades can walk free anywhere in Australia. I can just walk anywhere and he'll just follow me. If I tell him to do something, like Spades will hold it down, stay for 50 minutes in front of a client's house, off the lead because it would be too hot for him to sit in the car. I'll come outside, I say, okay, and he goes. And people he knows are, not to move. There's nowhere to go anyway, right? Yeah. And if I was to um, stay in that house all day, he'd, the worst thing he'd do is get up and probably come to the door. He's waiting for you. Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm everything for him. Yeah. And, and in reality, us as dog owners are everything to our dogs because we are the providers. Yeah. So we need to be able to, we need to represent that in our actions with them. And, um, and because spades know, and that's a bit of a paradox. And that's why people, you know, like we got all the animal justice people in the world, they say, no, we need to free all the animals. Let them be free. First of all, let the dogs be free. If we let any animal go back in their wild setting, there is infinite more rules that they need to follow by nature, that their consequences are so much more in, um, dangerous to them compared to the rules that I would put on a dog and enforce and follow through, the outcomes are so much different. So yeah. just because you're free, it doesn't mean you're free. Yeah, <laughs> You still need to follow those rules, um, somebody's rules, whether it's your own, whether it's your master's or whether it's nature. Mm. And I think that's really important that um, people start to see that as, and like when we think of a job, like, and I'm not sure if we spoke about this last episode, but hey, we're going to talk about it again, is that us humans are hunter-gatherers. We are meant to be hunting animals. Like, so men generally were the warriors, the hunters. They were out and they were doing those harder jobs. Catching food. Catching food, um, protecting the, the tribe, etc. So um, now how do we fulfill that? Well, we can't go and fight our neighbor and we're not really hunting animals because that's just not in the world that we live in at the moment. But we fulfill that void by doing the sport. So we play that sport, we get together, we create a tribe or a team. Well, sport. I mean, team sports are basically hunting games. That's what they are. 100%. You, you're aiming a target. Uh, so you're aiming a projectile at a target, whether that's a ball into a net or a, an arrow into a, yeah. you know. Exactly. whatever like that's that's what sports are they're, yeah they're, so we're they're mimicking for, hunting exactly we're fulfilling that instinctive need that we have and generally as a general statement the females were normally the gatherers they were the one that would gather and um you know whether it was the cane for the baskets and the berries for the food and you know and gathering the things that we need for us to survive on that level so generally we see the women would enjoy gathering of some form, whether it's a shopping um, adventure or whether it was gathering the food together so we can cook for the night. Like these are traditional roles that, you know, people can argue. I guess it could be controversial on one end because either all can do whatever. Yeah, of course. But these are general roles that we have. So, And, of course, mothers are great nurturers and that's why they're good mums and they look after babies very well. I could look after my baby pretty well, but I know that my wife looks after my baby 10 times better than me mm. because she's already got that inside her. Yeah. So we need to honor and fulfill those needs, even though we're not going to do it directly how our ancestors did it. We need to manipulate it so we're still fulfilling it so we can free ourselves from suffering now. So that's what we're doing with our dogs and we should do it with ourselves. I think it's really important. Yeah, man. And, um, and when we don't give that job or if we don't see the need to give that job, I feel that people become too complacent and then they want to blame somebody else. Oh, it's because of the breed he is. Oh, and that's just how he is and he likes to do that. Now, dogs obviously have these tendencies or unique characteristics, whether it's because of their breed or whether it's because of, you know, the outcomes of what's happened in their life. But if we're not being proactive in that in that situation, and we're not going to see many. So you might see a new client, and they're saying, "Okay, my oh my dog just he 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 misbehaves like this, or you know that's his that's just his character, his nature." And then you know you implement that structured um, training, that structured walk, and then within a few sessions, the dog's shifted. Do you find that the client's sort of like, "Oh, now it makes sense"? Yeah, like look, there's as you've seen in my in the session that you came. There's so many things that are happening in like a five-minute situation of your dog being out and about. Spades. Spades. Down. Good boy. Don't want to knock in the camera over now, eh? Good boy. Yeah, so I think working this theory is, it's a theory. Putting into practice becomes such a whole, you know, there's so many, we can't just go, hey, give your dog a job. Like, for example, one dog may not see food as a high value to work for. 
So maybe the staffy would like to play tug more. Right. So then we're going to use the tug as part of the reward. You've got to you've got to figure that out. Exactly. And you talk about that. Um, you were talking about that last week. The uh, with the client, you've got to find that high value reward, right? For Whether sure. that's food. Well, it's obviously food comes into it most of the time. But whether yeah. that's a ball or a, a rope or a whatever, yeah. what, what's that dog into? Yeah. So, for example, Nookie loves food, but she really loves the ball too. Yeah. Spades isn't really into the ball, right? He's like, Not whatever, man. Yeah. So, he will work for food. So, I use food for his motivator. But with Nookie, I'm going to use... Okay, okay. Then we're going play. to... Yeah, we're going to use food to shape behavior and show him how to do it. And we can talk about that in more detail. We're going to do a later episode on that as well. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. it's important. But um, but as a general kind of theory is that I use the food to shape behavior, but now I've got that ball and she loves that ball. So if she'll be out there on a long lead out in the distance, I call her to come. She comes to me. I tell her to down. I'll tell her to spin, touch my hand. I'll give a few different commands. I then give my marker. In her case, it's the word bang. And then I throw that ball. And then I was wondering she knows it's gonna, on. <laughs> as soon as I say that word, she's almost running, anticipating the ball is going to come. So that way there I use. So I want to be... I want to have good time management with your dog. You want to be able to, able to get your hour to be as fulfilling for that dog as possible because we don't have more than an hour generally to exercise our dogs. Yeah. We've got too many demands in our life, um, you know, from work and to responsibilities and looking after yourself and your family, et cetera. And it's probably enough too, right? Like I noticed um, towards the end of that session last week, Maze was so physically fulfilled. She was just like, she was just like, like you or I would be after a, a, a hard session in the gym. You're exactly. just like, man, I feel great, but like I'm ready. I'm I'm done. That's you know, right. her tongue was starting to hang out a bit, That's and like, right. yeah, that mind and that body. It's it's really amazing to see. And so, for example, um, so like with Maze, or like with this sort of this concept here, is that if we after a walk, we should be able to come home, drink some water, and have a rest. Like that's a point of exercise. Yeah. If we have a child and we see them playing in the playground, they'll play for hours at that party, hours just running. There's not much structure, even though they make their own little rules up, whether it's playing tip or we're playing, you know, whatever, cowboys and Indians or something, they're going to play that game. Yeah. But because there's no structure involved, they can do that for a long time. I think once we see them playing a game of sport, give them that game of soccer for an hour, maybe an hour and a half or whatever it is, they're a lot more gassed and tired after it. It's time for them to rest and have nap time. Yeah. And it's the exact same thing that we're working with our dogs. So the point of t- today's sort of topic was to expose a little bit of that and not see training as this is one response to a certain behavior. It's more about what are your goals with your dog? So if I have that staffy and when I'm working with staffy dogs, is that they, like, let's just say, it's a staffy in this situation. American staffy is very big, he's very strong. He has a tendency to jump and bite people's clothes. Now we can correct him for biting the clothes or try to reward him with food for not biting our clothes. And that's part of the routine for sure. But how about we give him a moment in the day, a five minute session of practicing obedience training, sit down, come look, etc. practice your bed, but then we reward him with that tug. So that tug then gives him that fulfillment to bite something and to thrash it about while we're working on it. Then, of course, we teach him how to drop. He lets go of it, and then we continue the game. So that way there we're fulfilling that. That even within the game as well, he knows that when you say drop or let go, he has to do that. For sure. So because even within the game, there's rules. It has to be. Yeah. For sure. And then that way there, that's going to work. So then when your dog does go to grab your shoe, you're in the living room and you grab your shoe, you say drop, he drops it. Yeah. And then we've got that command kind of ready to go. Again, these things are all theories and dogs have the mind of their own. So, you know, putting into practice is always going to vary from dog to dog. Yeah. But you got to make sure you're giving that that dog a specific motivation and an exercise that speaks his language. Like, for example, with spades, he's very rarely going to play tug, but he loves to do his command. So if I was out in the park and I got my pouch on me and I was to offer a command, he will do it. Or, for example, with Because him, he knows the food's there. He knows the food's there, but even without the food, and if I have the food hidden, he would still do the behavior just as reliably. Yeah. Actually, most of the time when I'm out with my clients, he's not being at this stage of, of his development. He doesn't need to be rewarded so heavily, but there's never a time where you shouldn't ever like completely stop rewarding. I don't think that's good for the dog because um, imagine you went to work and like you want that raise. You don't just get the raise. You've got to work harder for yeah. it. So at, at the end of the day, if we're not, increasingly increasing the 
the requirements of what the job is in relation to how much reward he gets and when he gets the reward. Yeah. I think then um, the dog loses that motivation. So we still, and depending on what you're trying to train, in terms of pet dog stuff, we're not really trying to develop very high drivey dogs that are willing to go in with massive power and accuracy. I think with most of my clients, they're not going to do much of that work. We just go, hey, you know what? Like when I go to the coffee shop, I just want to say down, he lays down, let me have my meal. I say, okay, we can walk. Yeah. Um, and that's only going to happen if you're consistent and you set it up so you don't just practice your down, stay in the backyard and then expect it to happen in the co- coffee shop. You need to make that progression towards that sort of stimulus when you're around all these people in this environment. So, yeah. Nice one, man. What do you reckon? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think so. Is that it? Is that uh, pretty much everything you wanted to say on that topic? I think so because then now we're starting to get into different other parts of, of the training, which um, – which is going to open up a whole other rabbit hole. But I think that was my, my, my general um, topic for the day. And, um, of course, anyone who's listening, you know, they can hit us up with questions, up questions or um, with any comments, Facebook, Instagram. We're yeah. going to be on YouTube as well. Yeah, man. And, um, and yeah. like, well, you know, when we were planning this podcast out, I was commenting to you that you gave me a list of probably 10 episodes. And they, to me, it read like the chapters of a book. So I think that's the idea is that it, everything, um, each episode has a structure and a theme, yeah, and that people can take away, you know, can read, can listen or watch a specific episode and take away something for sure. I think you know, if we have a, a good progression, kind of working towards something that way, they now that we've talked about dogs need a job and we've talked a very general sense of it, then that way, there, when we talk in the next few episodes down the track, talking about how to reinforce a dog and why, we, then at least we know why we're doing this. And that's why I give a little bit of this theory to my clients at the beginning of the session so then they understand. Now that we're doing all this, now at least you know what's the purpose of it. We're not just doing, like people ask me all the time, why do I teach my dog to down? What's the point of down? And that's a pretty good question if you've never taught your dog to down. Yeah. All right? It's but a fair now, question. Yeah. yeah. So I can get my dog to sit, but how long is he going to hold a sit for? What, five minutes? It's a pretty tiring activity sitting in one spot if you're a yeah. dog. Yeah, down is a little bit more of a structured position. Um, it's a lot more- Easier for the dog. Easier they're, for they're lying down, basically. They're lying down yeah. as well. And also, yeah, it's a, a, a little bit more comfortable for them. And also, I find that it looks less like to the general public. If a dog's in a down compared to a sit, it's harder for him to get out of the out of the down um, from the sit position. But also in that down, it gives him a sense of I'm in position. I'm yeah. here. And yeah. yeah, it's more comfortable for him. So, you know, we have to know why we're doing it. Even if you're never going to use your down in that particular situation, why not give your dog a set of set of commands, give him some vocabulary, give him, he wants to work and they're, they're willing to do it for us, but we've got to be putting the time and effort into it. So yeah, we do it because that's why we have dogs, right? Do we have dogs just so we can pat them and then let them go? Well, then you may as well get a teddy bear. You get the dog so we can. One last thing actually. So I was watching um, Todd Sampson's Body Hack oh, yeah. on Channel 10 and um, really cool show. I yeah, he's amazing, that guy. Yeah, I, I, really, yeah, yeah. I really enjoy it. And you look at the, um, he was out at... Um, Somewhere up north, um, I think it was in, in Australia. No, in in Russia. Oh yeah, somewhere. And then I think I watched that one. Siberia, I think. Siberia, it was. Yeah, possibly yeah, yeah. was. And they were like they were nomadic. So every four days they would pack their stuff up and move. And they were reindeer um, herders, and they used the reindeers to to um obviously they eat the reindeers, but also they use them for for their um for carting their things around, right? Because they're hunter gatherers yeah. essentially. And um and those dogs live with them. Like we made dogs. Dogs exist because of us. Yeah. And we can't just let them just hang around just because they're like, we have this innate connection with these dogs. We need to honor and fulfill what our ancestors did for them. We need to keep that going because if we don't, we're going to have more issues with, with, um, with council and with the laws and with other dog owners or other people being um, disadvantaged by us as dog owners. Even dogs barking constantly all day or if a dog attacks your cat or kills one of your family members, like, my God, how horrific is that? Yeah. So we need, to, we need to be doing this so that way that we're constantly giving our dogs that purpose. Makes sense. For sure. All right. Perfect. Thanks for another episode. Yeah, thanks, man. Beautiful. <laughs> Good one. <laughs>